Welcome to Wannabe Clutter Free, formerly Wannabe Minimalist, the podcast for busy families who are tired of the chaos, fed up with being overwhelmed, and ready to enjoy life again. Each week, we talk about how to let go of the clutter so that you can focus on the things that actually matter. And it's not just physical clutter. We talk about the mental and emotional stuff too, because if it's holding you back, it's time to ditch it. I share what I've done in my own life to declutter, organize, and calm the chaos, but you won't just hear it from me. There are amazing guests too. It's practical, doable, and simple for those of us that want to be clutter-free. Well, hey there, my friend. Welcome back to the show. I'm Deanna Yates, and you are listening to episode 204 of the Wanna Be Clutter Free podcast. On today's episode, I'm chatting with Ani Michelski about quieting our inner mean girl, how we can find our passion, how we can help our children find their passion. It is a really interesting episode. We dive a little bit deeper into my life. I am a little bit vulnerable on this show. I think you're going to like it. So make sure you stick around. Ani has some amazing information to share with us. And I just really enjoyed our conversation. And I think you will too. But before we get into it, I just want to take one quick moment to say thank you so much for being here today. I am grateful that you are a listener to this show. And I hope you like what you hear. If you do, can you help me out? There's a couple things I would love for you to do. If you want to share it with a friend that also helps you get an accountability partner, it's one of the best ways that we can actually grow this show if you do enjoy it. And it's one of the best ways you can support me in the work that I do every week. You can also leave a rating or a review for this show on whatever app you prefer to listen to this podcast. You can also comment and share the show on social media if you're so inclined. And if you do, go ahead and tag me. I'm at wannabeclutterfree on the social channels. I will leave links in the show notes for where you can go to get all of that information. So go to wannabeclutterfree.com slash 204 to get that information. Again, that's wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 204. All right, that's enough housekeeping for today. Let's learn more about my guest this week. Ani Wachowski is a licensed therapist, life coach, and devoted mother of six. Yep, you heard me right. Six. Her passions lie in inspiring high performing women who have lost their sense of self amidst the demands of motherhood. As the founder of Moms Without Caves, Ani's mission is to help moms get themselves back on their own to do list so that they can get back in touch with who they were before they became mom. It is a great episode. Like I said, make sure you listen to it and then check out Ani's information after this episode at wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 204. And now let's get to our conversation. All right, Ani. Well, hi and welcome to Wannabe Clutter Free. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me, Deanna. I'm excited to be here. Me too. This is going to be a good one. We're going to dive into some really fun topics. But why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you help busy moms? Sure. So I am a licensed therapist and a life coach, as well as a recovering super mom. And what I mean by that is for a long time, I thought I had to do it all. And it really created a lot of extra stress in my life. And then I realized that I was able to let that go. And I had to do a lot of mindset work and recognize that It really came down to me being a worthy and equal member of my family. I'm a mom of six. So our oldest is 24 down to age 10. And I really started doing the work when our oldest was 11. So it's been a while. It's been a while that I've been on this journey. And right now I have two businesses. I have a counseling business and a coaching business where I do different things, virtual and in-person right here in my community. I reign from Montana originally from the East Coast, but I'm here and I'm just excited to be here today and be able to share this message and be here on the Wanna Be Clutter Free podcast. Oh my gosh, you are must be so busy. We're going to get some really great tips from you today. I only have one. I cannot imagine having six kids. Ours is 10, so we're still in the thick of it with the same with your youngest. So I can't wait to get some just selfishly, get some good tips for what I should be looking out for. Because as a mom with five that have already gone past the stage where I am, I cannot imagine. And honestly, not just the tough parts that are coming. I am so excited just to watch her grow into the person she's going to be. So I'll get your tips and insights on that a a little bit. But before we get in, I just want to say how much I love the title of your business, 
Moms Without Capes, and even more the tagline, Confessions of a Recovering Supermom, which you already talked about. And that hits home for me so much because I am definitely one of those people who tries to maximize everything. I try to do the best I can. I'm a little type A, shocker. So I really just resonated with that tagline. So what made you want to write and talk about your life from that angle? Well, it's funny that you say you're type A because I am too, like that go-getter. And I, when I first started my businesses, I had started both combined, right? Counseling and coaching. And I had, I don't, I, it would take forever to share my story, but one thing led to another. I was a Zumba instructor when I started realizing it all started with a Zumba class. I just wanted to do this class and I couldn't figure out how to do it. I felt like everything had to be in order for me to step away and do it without feeling extreme guilt. And my friend kept asking me, asking me, and I was like, I couldn't, you know, and at the same time, I couldn't let my kids go to my in-laws for no other reason, but because I felt like it was my job and I just couldn't detach my identity from being mom. Like it was so swirled around my role as a mom that I couldn't separate. And everything I did revolved around my kids and my family. So fast forward, I became a certified health coach. And then I decided to go back and get licensed as a counselor because back in 2003, when our oldest was three, I had graduated with my, like from graduate school with a master's in counseling. So fast forward 2017, I had started the process of getting, we had to get like 3000 hours. I had to get 3000 hours to, of supervised, like work under a supervised, under a counselor, a licensed counselor. And I had also built this Zumba business as an instructor. And then in 2019, I'm like, all right, I'm starting my own business. I left the mental health agency and I had, I was a certified health coach and decided to start a coaching and counseling business. And I hired a business coach and she was like, well, you need to niche down. And because I had started doing all of these things, like I'd started running half marathons and really like focusing on personal growth and nutrition was a big thing. I had lost a lot of weight along the way. And so my first thing was like, okay, I'll help people lose weight. And she's like, you have to niche down, niche down. And I started, I actually, my whole Facebook community, my business, everything was like based on helping Christian women lose weight. And I just came upon that because I'm Christian and it just... I was like, all right, this is my niche. And I started talking about it, but it just never felt right. Like I started right in Facebook lives, holding events. And I'm like, it's just not, I felt like I wasn't showing up as my authentic self and it just wasn't landing right. And so about six months later, I just went back, started doing a lot of journaling and realizing thing that like when I could go to that Zumba class, when I could start asking my family to step up and like me stepping back and doing all of those things, it required a lot of work, but the weight loss was just the byproduct of me actually putting, like prioritizing myself. And so I'm like, that's where I want to help moms. I want to help moms realize, especially type A moms that are like overscheduled, overcommitted, thinking they have to do all the things, the same place I was way back when and couldn't figure out how to go to that Zumba class. I want to help other women be able to do that. Other moms realize that they are more than a mom. They can detach their identity from that of motherhood and do what they love or do what they want to do. And whether that's start a business, go back to school, get a hobby, learn how to surf, like whatever it is that they want to do, be able to do it without the guilt and pursue their own passions. Because I realized when I started doing that, I opened up this whole part of me that I was denying my kids of even knowing or my husband, like I put myself on the back burner and it was really effective. It was building resentment. My husband would do things. I'd be like, how is he able to do this? How has he been able to sit on the couch and watch this football game? Can he see that this floor needs to be vacuumed and like a lot of passive aggressive behaviors and things. And I just had to learn to relax. I learned, I had to learn how to step back and be like, I'm the one who's has this never ending to do list it's okay to step back and not think that I have to be doing all the things. And so that's where Moms Without Capes was born. And the name, people ask me this all the time. I'm like, I don't even know. I read a book on branding and I was like, and I just started, that was like about the same time I was 
trying to, I'm like, I don't want to do weight loss, but what do I want to do? And I Googled the domain and it was available. <laughs> Because I'm like, it's the super mom, right? Super mom syndrome and like how to overcome that. And just that, and I constantly seeing those things like, you know, moms are superheroes without the capes and stuff. And I'm like, enough already, because that is stressful. That is like digging, that's feeding into the whole hustle culture thing. And I couldn't, that whole idea of trying to be a superhero kept me at a point of exhaustion and burnout and feeling like I couldn't even be present because I had all of these expectations that I had internalized from this whole idea of being this everything to everybody. And I also struggled with the people pleasing and perfectionism and those things that kept me thinking I couldn't even do the class because there was, you know, I had to cook the meals. I had to do the dishes. I had to you know, I was homeschooling at the time because that's part of it. I even say like the whole idea of having six kids, like none of them were planned. And I'm like, I feel like it was just like, the, I've got to do more. I've got to do more. I've got to do more. And because my identity was so wrapped up in me being a mom, I didn't allow for any other things to enter my life. Hmm. So interesting. Oh, I'm definitely on the path. I am Oh, every, some days I feel like I'm doing so well. And then other days I'm just like, nope. Uh, there's that, I mean, just the the thoughts just come back, right? So my husband and I have been in the startup world, right? Where if hustle culture is anywhere for in the forefront. I mean, it is all about the startup world and entrepreneurship and do more faster and just grind until you make it, which, you know, I get that you hear the stories, right? Like the stories that get publicized and the stories you hear about are the people that can persevere. I even remember way back, I'm going to date myself here, way back to Jewel, right? And the story of her being homeless and playing guitar in her car. And finally she made it. And just like this whole thing of like, you have to sacrifice everything in order to reach your dream. And all of those beliefs that get ingrained in you when you're younger and you don't even realize they've imprinted on you. Those are the kinds of thoughts that I definitely have been working and struggling to overcome. But it does, as you grow up and become a mom and get out into the world, it becomes, you know, it manifests in so many different ways. It manifests in that never ending to do list. It manifests in trying to be a great and gracious host. It manifests in trying to start a business or two <laughs> and all of the things, right? Even that, even that, yeah. Even that, right? Let's take a quick break. And later in this show, Ani's going to tell us about how we can start to quiet our inner mean girl. You don't want to miss it. I'm Margaret. And I'm Amy. And together we host the podcast, What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood. Margaret, I would say you're sort of a where are my keys kind of mom. Correct. Sometimes a where are my kids kind of mom. <laughs> well, you're Amy more of a we were supposed to leave 35 seconds ago, mom. I mean, touche. In each episode of What Fresh Hell, we come at a topic from our usually completely opposite perspectives. I bring the research. And I bring kind of the gimlet eye. Like, is that research really going to work, people? And almost 10 million downloads later, we're still laughing. We also talk to experts in the parenting field, plus parents with stories we can all learn from. We make each other laugh, we challenge each other's assumptions, and we have what we think is the best parenting community on the internet. Check out What Fresh Hell? Laughing in the Face of Motherhood wherever you listen to podcasts. And it's so interesting how... You just don't see it, but you feel it. So you know something's off. So how can we start to, this I'm getting a little off topic, but how do you recommend people start to, if they're feeling like something's not right, but I don't know what it is. And you're so close, right? You can't see the forest through the trees or for the trees, whatever that saying is. So how do you start? Where do you start to open your eyes and say, oh, okay, this is maybe this isn't right. Or maybe I need to rethink this thought or. How do we go about it? Yeah, because we're spinning so many plates. Like we're spinning so many plates and it's hard to know which to lay down. And it, it really does start with awareness and becoming more aware. And sometimes it takes a professional, like whether you go to counseling or hire a coach or somebody or even in a small group of friends and be like, listen, there's something like it comes in sharing that vulnerability piece 
Like this is what's going on. Instead of continuing to push and push and push, being aware of your own limitations and saying you can't go forward unless you just stop and take an objective look of what's going on. I know like I'm coming on today to talk about that inner mean girl and you touched on where those beliefs and those thoughts come from. It's from those years of experiences of things we've been through or the things we've witnessed. And it took years to ingrain those beliefs. And so it, you have to be able to introduce self-compassion into the whole process and know that it's not going to change overnight because we have confirmation bias, which we are constantly looking for things that are going to reinforce those beliefs or that are in line with those beliefs. And whether those beliefs are not even serving us anymore, we still take this other stuff in as evidence that this belief is true. And so becoming aware of like, cause that there's lots of evidence that exists that it's not true, but being aware of what am I thinking and just getting in touch with yourself, which is one of my big things is like, I help moms reclaim their sense of self the reclaim their sense of identity within motherhood. But in order to know yourself, you need to spend time with yourself. And that is in meditation, in journaling, in doing things that are going to challenge you and push you to where like to your uncomfortable, right? Nothing grows in a comfort zone. And so it's not going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen without you intentionally taking note of what's going on. And feeling off kiltered, I think is a good thing. Our emotions are a good thing, but we need to get curious of them. And often we push them down and we think, I shouldn't be feeling this way. Like, I, and that off, feeling off kilter, you're like, you know, I'm doing something wrong. Well, no, it just means that you need to step back and take a look at what's going on and really take an honest assessment of what can change because there are going to be plates that you can lay down, but you've got to examine your why behind and really take stock of what's going on. And here's, I heard this analogy recently and I love it because it made such sense about when we are spinning so many plates and it was this backpack analogy where we all carry our own like survival backpack and it's all the things that we are responsible for. So our health, our faith, um, our thoughts, our beliefs, our attitudes, all of these things that belong to us. But too often we take other people's things that belong to them and we stuff it into our backpack and then we don't have room for ourselves, like for the things that belong to us. Or we'll take things out of our backpack that do belong to us and we try to stuff them in other people's backpacks. One thing that I did for years was I would blame the fact that I couldn't make time for myself, like say to go to the gym or even to go for a walk. So that's my health into my kids' backpacks. And saying, I don't have time because of my kids, because I, they need me. Instead of taking that back, taking ownership, and then giving them what they're responsible for. And teaching them that this is what they need to take care of, holding them accountable. And that might be them doing their own laundry, rather than me doing that and then not having time to go for a walk. So it's this backpack analogy that helps create that separateness or create a boundary Whereas like what belongs to me and helps you look at what plates you're spinning that you might not need to be anymore so that you can lay them down. And that with that comes examining your perfectionism, your people pleasing, your why. Why are you doing this? Is this serving me? Is this serving them? And really taking that look. Hmm. That's a fun analogy. I like that. I haven't heard that one before. I'll have to mull over that one and kind of look and see yeah, what is in my backpack? It's interesting. So I think of backpack and I immediately think of traveling and we are huge fans of The Amazing Race. And we are just, we just literally booked tickets last night as the time of recording this to get to go back over to Europe again. And it's been five years since we've been out of the country. So we're super excited about it. But I also was finding a hard time with the perfectionism of making sure we got the right ticket making sure we maximized the miles we had and all that kind of stuff. So all of this is really interesting. And a lot of it too, as we were planning this trip, I even said these words last night. This was easier when we were planning this when it was just the two of us because we've done two or actually three stints in Europe. So one that we left the day after I found out I was pregnant. So 
Our daughter has been with us every single time I've been to Europe. <laughs> Just some through your belly button. That's how my kids saw Disney World. <laughs> Just some differently. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> she was in my belly the first time, which then cut down on the amount of wine I got to drink. <laughs> which was really obnoxious, but that's fine. Totally worth it. Anyway, so yeah, we found out the night before we left. I was like, okay, well, that's great. Great news, but different than I expected. And then the second time she was a year. So there was a whole different ball game, but also not so hard. It actually was much easier than when she was a toddler. You know, we would travel around the U.S. to family because she slept so much. It was so easy to travel with her when she was one. It was so easy. And then when she was five, a little bit different, right? Well, she has her own opinions and her own personality. <laughs> she has her own opinions. And now she's going to be 11. And so this time, I definitely had a whole nother layer that I was popping in my backpack of like, I have to make sure she enjoys this trip. That is not an expectation I need to put on myself. Like, what's the difference? We live in San Diego. I mean, let's be honest. We live in an awesome place, right? People come vacation here and they are doing the same thing I am doing to go other places to come here where we live every single day. So I feel very blessed to be here. I absolutely love it. But just the idea of like, do I feel like it's my job to entertain her every day of the summer when we're at home? Part of that is yes. There's definitely a layer of that where I feel responsible, but I need to figure out how can I unload some of this back to her. I don't remember my parents worrying about what I did. And maybe they did, right? These are the conversations I should have with them, though, because my recollection, they didn't think about it, but maybe they did. So we probably should have that conversation. I went to a, a single household daycare. That was their thinking about it. We're going to send her to Ginger's and she'll get to deal with it. So I don't have that. That's okay. That's on me. Again, different choices in different circumstances. But it is, that is a layer. I definitely need to work on letting go. So do you have any tips on that? <laughs> well, I'm wondering, you're saying you need to have conversations with your mom or your parents about their choices, but have you had conversations with your daughter? Because at 11, I know with my own, so we have five daughters and one son. And with my daughters, especially, I feel like there have been times where I have dragged them to like the, I want to go to gymnastics. This was the worst, the gymnastics one. I want to go to gymnastics. And so I signed them up, paid the fee, all that stuff. Well, they went once. And then the second time it was like me dragging them. And every week I'd be like, you guys wanted to do this. Like I should not have to force this. This is supposed to be fun, right? <laughs> and it was not fun. It wasn't fun for any of us. And so then I got this thing like, okay, they have to do some really good convincing in order for me to sign them up for anything. But having that conversation with your daughter in the summer, like what is bringing in her input? Because at 11, she definitely would have some input. It's so like, well, what do you want to try? What are some of the things that you want to get her expectations on the table so that she can have some autonomy? She can get some things like from her backpack and feel like she's got in control Whereas her whole summer isn't planned for her. And then you get that pushback or you get that where she gets to the end of the summer and she really hasn't had anything. And even your, even in smaller scale, like your vacation to, to Europe, does she know, like, has she been involved in the, because that will take some of the load off of you to be able to say, Hey, I want you to do this research. I want you to, here's a book or whatever, like a website Give me a couple ideas of things that you want to do. So that takes the planning off of you so you're not 24-7 having to entertain. Yeah, I have had some conversations with her. I struggle because she doesn't seem... She loves to read. She loves to have playdates with her friends still. She's still very much a kid. We've tried different activities. Nothing has really stuck. So we're about to try a new one to see if that works. But she just hasn't really found her groove, I don't think, either, which I think is totally fine. But it's also difficult to have a moment of like, what do you like to do? She wants to just sit and watch people play Minecraft videos. And I'm just like, okay. This is my 14-year-old. But one of the things like that was 
brought up to me was the fact like people watch they'll go and watch basketball or they'll go and watch those kinds of things. And so what is different between them watching a basketball game versus them watching um, somebody play a Minecraft video? Like I was like, there really isn't much difference, but why does that annoy us so much? <laughs> I don't know that it annoys me that she watches the Minecraft videos. I think it's that she doesn't have anything else she really likes to do in addition to like, you know, I'm, that's the thing like she if I if I let her she would literally just come home and watch Minecraft videos all afternoon until I said okay it's time for dinner like you know and so I, I, that's where I struggle is just with how do I figure out what she's into and I guess maybe some of that is still trying to find my own passions so I definitely see there is I was just gonna say how do you find out well, I think I still struggle with it. I think my passion is trying new things. I literally think that is my passion. I don't think I'm one person that's all in. I love to dabble. I love to learn new things. I mean, I started this podcast on a whim because it sounded fun because I was blogging and was like, that is torture for me. Like, I just, I'm not good at the written word, but you get me on video or talking to people and I'm just, I, I light up. I love it. So I started this and it has been my jam for, oh my God, we're going on like four years. Like what? That is insane to me to think about. But so I think that, and she sees me do this and she participates and she listens to some of the shows. And so she knows I really like this part and different things, but I think she sees that as work. And so it doesn't translate the same. I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out for me too. Let's take another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to start talking about how we can figure out our own passions so that we can help out our children. It's an area I definitely struggle in. And so this information was good for me today too. It doesn't translate to like a passion. Yeah. And I think that I, I think you're onto something there. Like for ourselves, what, how, how do we discover what we're interested in? And what you're experiencing, I think, is something that a lot of moms experience or a lot of parents. I should just say moms, like a lot of parents. Like I said, as soon as you start saying, I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. My younger one is my 14 year old. That's one of our big things. And she wants to get her phone back now. And so, because we had to take it for some reasons. And so now we're like, you know what? We're going to give it back to you when you get involved in something. Like we want you to, and so we started that conversation and it's like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Like everything. So I looked up, I'm taking her to some drawing, like at an art studio near here to do drawing. And I'm like, even that, it's not like a class, but I'm like, I need her to have an interest. And when we think about how do we find what we're interested in and that trying new things. And I think that comes with being able to be confident of, or not afraid of failure or not like there's some things that need to develop over time that's going to help us have the confidence or courage to try the new things to see if it's something that we enjoy or that we're passionate about and I think back like I don't think it's something we're born with I think it's something that because I'm thinking back back in time since 2011, where I feel like that was like my big time when I started doing the work and started trying new things and gaining that confidence. I actually learned how to surf in La Jolla Beach, right? but that's something I never would have before. And even being the Zumba instructor and doing those kinds of things, it's almost like we need to create those, that evidence that's going to negate those beliefs we have. And we need to be responsible for that. We need to be able to create these opportunities. And as parents, we need to do the same as our kid and realize like that self-compassion piece. We need to be able to guide them along so that we create those opportunities for them to discover their passion. Because I don't know, when you were 14, what were you like? What was I like? I feel like I've always been, I've always been really good at school. I've always been really into that. Both of my parents worked. So I spent a lot of time at the daycare so I still, even at, even through junior high, I went to, she, I would go to her house after school, even through junior high. And then in high school, I mean, I always ended up, I'm a bit of a workaholic. I did cheer. I always danced grow, growing up. So I was in dance from the time I was three through 12 or 13. And then I did cheer and gymnastics. 
And then I worked. I always had a job from the time I was probably 15 and a half, maybe 16. And then, yeah, so that was always my jam was that. I wouldn't say cheer was my passion. I fell into it. So I think maybe I struggle still with figuring out what my passion is. So I maybe spend more time on me and it'll be easier to help her. (laughs) So maybe talking to her about that, like having that conversation with her, you know, role modeling, the whole idea of I'm talk to her more about how this is something I wasn't sure if it was going to work. I still don't know, like with my podcast, I'm like, Alex, I still don't know if it's going to work, but I'm going to try because I find that this is something that I enjoy and I'm going to just see. So letting her know like that, even though to her, it looks like work, that it's something you really enjoy and talk to her about that process of what it took to. And as I'm saying it to you, I'm like, yeah, I need to do this with my own kids. So <laughs> just <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Like just talking to her. This is how I discovered the things that I like. And you're saying just four years ago, I imagine, I don't know how old you are, but it took you that long to realize like this thing. And there's going to be throughout your life, different things that you're going to just try. It's like just not really knowing. And it's that uncertainty and that confidence piece that you're, you need in order to try those things. And yeah. So she is a total homebody. When I'm home, I struggle with getting the motivation to get out and do new things. And you always have the, well, we're here, so I could do it tomorrow, right? You just put stuff off, right? Whereas like I'm a a huge travel fan, right? And we were talking about, and people that have heard this show or heard me talk know a little bit of my story. Like we've lived a ton of places. We've traveled a ton. So for me, like I've always, I would say, that's why I say trying new things is my passion. I love that. I love it. I've always been independent. I've never been afraid of trying new things. I've got this picture behind us. This is um, an actual picture. We went hang gliding in Rio de Janeiro. This is the platform you run off of with your instructor, like out into the ocean. And it's just like that kind of stuff. I've never been afraid of trying new things. I'm not afraid of failing. I don't think anybody knows what they're doing in the world. I think everybody is just trying to figure it out. And so that part doesn't bother me. So from my own standpoint, it's hard for me to maybe step back and have that moment of like. Or to step into. I guess I don't know the one thing I'm. Yeah, I don't have the one thing I'm super passionate about. Because you're multi-passionate. So maybe I'm multi-passionate. I just like I'm just passionate about just living and trying new things and doing different things and, you know, let's give it a try. If it doesn't work, all right, we'll change it and do something else. So what do you feel that you've been able to step into your daughter's shoes to see what that feels like? Or is it a fear of failure or is it what is stopping her from trying new things? Yeah, I need to dig deeper there, I think. I don't know. Yeah. So like to just have that conversation with her or multiple conversations and, and besides giving her like a, a peek behind what you're thinking and how you're able to work past those self-doubts and to you, like, you're like, I didn't even have those self-doubts. I just do it. Right. But there is those things, but you've been able to overcome them. And because think of our, like our brain neurologically, like physiologically, it, it was designed to keep us safe. And so you have, even though you're saying, I just do it, there is those self-doubts that, that come up just because that's your brain's job is to keep you alive. And so hand gliding off of the platform in <laughs> De Janeiro, right? And so how do you work past that? How do you overcome? And it might be that thing, you know, I'm going to do it because whatever that thought is that you have, and they're automatic. So you might not even realize it's happening, but maybe you're thinking is you only live once, or this is going to be exciting. And you turn that fear into an excitement or any kind of nervousness, right? Because we feel, we experience anxiety or nervousness the same way as excitement. And so you're able to bring up that, those feelings that you're having and reframe them. And maybe talking through that experience with your daughter of like how you've been able to overcome any kind of fears or any kind of doubts that come up for you might help her kind of connect the dots to be able to be more adventurous or be able to step out of that comfort zone. Because in that comfort zone, we're safe. We know that like we're going to be alive. (laughs) 
And so that's going to keep us from doing those things that are going to make us feel alive or going to make us feel like we are passionate or bring out those passions. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I like it. So I think what we're, I'm just obviously have been loving this conversation and hopefully the listeners are too. They're getting a little bit more of a deeper insight into my family dynamic, I think, than normal. So hopefully they like it. But we were originally going to talk about quieting our inner mean girl. And I feel like this is something that I definitely struggle with. Again, back to that type A personality. If I don't do it well, and this is where I see myself and my daughter, right? If I don't do it well, what was wrong with me, right? Why can't I do it? Why am I struggling? This is something I have definitely been working on because I have a 10-year-old daughter and because She is such a reflection of myself in a lot of ways, not in all of them, obviously, but just that moment of like, I understand, I read very early on that the way I talk to her is the way she's going to talk to herself. And that just like, oh my God, like talk about mom guilt. That's a lot of pressure. Okay, let's do this. And then also she was so mean to me when she was little, like I was the person that she just would let loose on. Right. And the daycare mom that I had her with when she was a toddler said, it's because you are her safe space. She feels safe with you. She has these walls up around everyone else, but you are the person she feels like she can show these emotions with and right. And let loose on. And you know, she knows you'll be there, which is great. So fun. I love being a mom. Sometimes it's so great. Isn't it so nice? You give everything and then they just throw dirt in your face. You're like, but reframing it that way of like, I'm her safe space. She needs a place to be able to be, right? Like just we all do. We need a place to land. We need a soft place to land. We need a place where we can just be like, I don't know. And so to be that person, be to know like, okay, you're the rock. That's okay. It's not, she's not lashing out at you. It's not you. It's the fact that she needs that place. Anyway, that has helped. So let's talk about this because I think both quieting our inner mean girl obviously is going to help with how we talk to all the people around us, including our children. And since you have five lovely daughters, spill. Let's do it. So, oh, well, I think what you're saying, do you follow Christina Kuzma? What is it? Kuzmic? the comedian okay so she's real she's a comedian and she speaks a lot on like mental health and like motherhood and she does this one real what you're saying about that what we say to ourselves comes out like our kids start saying to them to themselves that we become their inner voice and she does this one real and it's like all about that like where she's walking around saying the different things and then she hears the daughter saying it but anyway so we have this internal dialogue our, like I say, the inner mean girl or our inner critic, right? It's like this internal monologue that we say to ourselves that keeps us playing small. And when we are constantly saying these things to us, because again, I said the confirmation bias, but we also have a negativity bias because that's going to keep us safe. If we're back evolutionary time, like when we're back at caveman times, if we are thinking, Chase, being chased by a saber-toothed tiger and we're thinking of rainbows and unicorns, we will be dead, right? So like, right? Can you just picture it? So we need to, like, we are geared or we're wired to think of the negative. So that means we have to work extra hard to be positive or to think of those positive things or to think of the good in things and especially in ourselves. And a lot of times we think that by berating ourselves or by being so critical of ourselves that we can push ourselves, but the opposite is true. And we need to be able to treat ourselves with compassion and we need to be able to give ourselves grace and know that we're going to be okay, but we need to just shift the way because words matter and the way we speak to ourselves matter. And this is something like we definitely need to be talking to our daughters about this because that internal monologue, like when to say, well, what is that voice that you hear in you? Like, does it belong to a specific person? Oftentimes it is like our parents, it is our moms and like the things like that, or maybe it's a situation that you've went through as a child and you can still hear that voice. 
and that feeling or that belief of inadequacy and what you were saying about, am I doing right? How am I doing the good things? Am I raising my daughter right? Like these are all these questions that are coming up that are coming from that belief of inadequacy and not being enough, which is one of the most common beliefs that we hold, as we, especially as women. And so it goes back to being aware of what are we saying to ourselves. And this can be just practicing mindfulness. Having check-ins is a great thing, a self-check-in, whereas you just say, what am I feeling right now? Where is it showing up my body? Putting a name to the word that you're feeling. If you can name it, you can tame it. We often just go to a handful of words, like feeling words. We're meant to feel a whole realm of emotions. We're not meant to always feel happy or always feel excited. There's going to be times where we feel sad or we feel anger. And that's when things get done. That's when you can, instead of squishing it or smushing it down, get curious about it and be like, why am I feeling sad right now? What is this experience trying to teach me? Or what's coming up for me? That why am I feeling sad? And working through it. Did have you ever read the your daughter the book I'm um, going on a bear hunt? I'm the one where like yeah 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 I'm like like the song like the I'm uh, going on a bear hunt. I'm like okay yeah I'm like having a moment but yeah or like you can't go over it you can't you can't go under it right right totally yes you got to go through it. It was like yeah it was my oldest daughter's. My, it was my oldest daughter's favorite book. And I often think of that like when I'm working through feelings with a client is we can't go over it. We can't go under it. We've got to go through it. And so often the feelings are so painful that we smush it down or we, we or like suppress the, the feeling, but it's going to come out somehow. And often it comes out through aggression or it comes out as an adult in relationships. It'll come out. And so being able to ourselves work through it and also teach our kids how to work through a feeling by naming it, by learning to sit with it, by not being afraid of it, by being curious about it, and then taking from it what you want to take from it is rather than suppressing it and then it doing a lot of damage. So we want to be able to get aware of what are we feeling. And once you name that, then you can do the work by saying, what was that thought that was making me feel this way? Like two people can go through the exact same situation and have completely different experiences or different feelings about it. And it's because their beliefs, the thoughts are different. And so when you are start, it's usually when you are feeling, you know, an uncomfortable or like a negative emotion, when you're feeling scared or angry or jealous or sad or whatever that feeling is that you don't want to feel, that's usually the time that you're like, okay, well, what is the thought that's making me feel this? What's going on here? And then once you have that thought, or it might be a few different thoughts, then you can start challenging that thought and, lo and looking for evidence that doesn't support it. Maybe seeing how it's twisted. Maybe you're doing some all or nothing thinking. Or you might be overgeneralizing, saying like, oh, I'm so awkward. I'm such an awkward person. When you just had like just an awkward experience or an awkward interaction with someone, that doesn't mean you're always awkward or that you're an awkward person. It just means that you had an awkward situation, an awkward interaction. And so taking time to analyze your thoughts and reflect on them and untwist them, see what would I tell a friend? in a similar situation? What would I tell a friend who's telling herself that she should want to be with her kids 24 seven and she's, she wants to take a break and she's feeling bad about it? Like, what kind of advice would I give if, if a friend came to me and shared that? And then giving yourself that same kind of advice and writing it down. I always think I, I'm a huge advocate of writing things down and journaling and even speaking things out loud. That's with like the power of therapy. My thing is talk therapy. I'm cognitive behavioral therapist. And so we do a lot of just speaking things out loud. I love it when clients are like, they'll say something and they'll be like, huh, like that's the first time I said it out loud. And when it comes out of your mouth and you put words to your thoughts, it can give you an entirely different perspective. And then that way you can move forward. But as long as it stays in our head, like the inner mean girl monologue can seem so jumbled 
and can add to the overwhelm that we're experiencing. And as moms, we experience enough overwhelm, like with all of the mental load and all of that checklist that we always think that we need to be doing more of. But all of that is going to continue to stay jumbled unless we take the time to actually reflect on our thoughts and get them sorted out. Clearly, all of that is amazing. And yes, the I think too, it is a struggle to identify, right? It is a struggle to, like you're saying, all of that stuff jumbled up. So when you can talk about it, when you write about it, you can start to make sense of these thoughts and beliefs and things that you have running around in your head that you don't, I mean, we're all moms, we're all busy. We've all got 9 million things on our plate. We don't actually take a moment to think about that stuff. So having those few minutes of just actually putting in the work, right? Meditating, journaling, talking to someone, those kinds of things. Yeah, it really can make a huge difference. So awesome. Getting yourself off of autopilot. As busy moms, we're constantly like on to the next thing. Like what, you know, I know, I mean, my schedule is full. And one of the things I talk about is that slowing down. And the about a year ago, I was complaining to my husband <laughs> about not I'm like I just I'm like I feel like I'm just too scheduled now I was working with a business coach and I remember crying to her and like I'm like I feel like I am dealing with the same thing that I'm trying to help moms deal with like this overwhelm and while I figured some things out I still feel like I shouldn't have these things right so just in what I just shared with you like I was having those I should I shouldn't be like and I was holding myself to this like double standard like why shouldn't I have to deal with all these things. And I was telling my husband, I was like, just discouraged. And he was like, you own your own business. Like you're creating your own misery. And I needed that to that perspective and be like, you're right. Like uh, to get back in there, but I had to get out of it in order and talk to people and realize what can I do differently? I am creating my own thing. And too often we live in this autopilot, just continually grind, grind, grind. And then we feel so stressed and we feel burnt out and we feel all of these, this like tension that we need to take ourselves out of to be able to see it, like what's on our plate. What is on our plate and it does everything on our plate. And that might mean like, and at that time I was in a group like this other group and I was, I was, I was in a, a weight loss group and I was looking at it and I'm like, you know, I'm like, this is, I'm stressed and this having to go to this meeting every week, like it's not, I, I know stress has to do with weight loss. I'm like, so I, I took myself out of that group. I limited the number of clients that I was seeing each week because that was another thing. Cause I was like, go, go, go. And I'm like, if this isn't serving me, like I need to take a, a look at this differently. But for a long time, like we, we, I know I've done that quite a bit of times over my life, like where I'm just go, 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 and then pull back. And I feel like some of that is we have to know what season we're in that whole season, you know, there's a season for everything. But when it when you're still working and that season has passed, we need to be able to pull back and objectively look at at what we need to be doing now rather than what we were doing. And so that self-reflection piece, I think has it's helped me be able to assess what's going on and what am I feeling, what am I thinking? You know, because those I base all my work on the cognitive theory. And that's where our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors all stem from the beliefs we hold. And so when we start shifting those beliefs, when we start creating opportunities for to test those ev that evidence and start like widening our view to be able to look for evidence that negates our beliefs, only then will we start shifting those underlying beliefs and realizing that we are enough. What I'm doing is enough. And, you know, it's okay to fail. Like those kinds of beliefs that have kept me playing small, I'm able to dispute them and change them. But as long as I'm living on autopilot, I can't. Hmm. Yeah. That's so, so good. Yeah. Put yourself in the gyro seat, take back the steering wheel. <laughs> like, let's do it. Get back what's in your backpack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unpack your backpack, pack it back up, get ready. Let's do this. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Ani, this has been great. Thank you so much. Just for a different, another take, a different perspective, things we talk about all the time. But again, it's always great to talk to somebody else about it. 
hear what other people are struggling with. Know that we're not alone. Know that not everybody has it together. There are things that I might be excelling in and then there's things I am not excelling in and right. And because I do, I struggle with the putting positivity out there and also putting negativity, not negativity, but the struggles, right? Telling people that like, look, my life's not perfect. I love my life. I feel very fortunate to live the life that I am living. It's not perfect though. And there are areas where I struggle and there's things that I want to improve and change and do all that kind of stuff. But also having that moment of gratitude and showing people that, I mean, I, I do appreciate what I have and where I am and who I am. But also being able to tell people and be vulnerable and be and say like, look, like I struggle too. And there are things that I, you know, want to improve and do differently. And, you know, we don't all know all the answers, right? So I think sometimes right. the human experience. Yeah, you can get a glimpse of other people and just think they have it all together. And, you know, everybody has things where they want to improve and trials and tribulations, of course. Yeah, right. And the goals. I like to say that like your goals list, it's not it, clearly the stuff on your goals list is stuff you're not doing. So it's not the easy stuff. It's not going to be easy to check the things off your list because there's all sorts of other things you're already doing that are on other people's goals list that you don't have on yours because they're second nature to you. They're easy. You've already done them. You've mastered that skill or whatever. So I think that's just so interesting too, right? Like just, yeah, work together, the human collective, all of that kind of stuff. I just, yeah, I love that. So yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. My gosh, we are going to have to do another one. I could sit here and talk to you all day, but I know my listeners are also going to want to come find you, your website, your podcast. Let us know. Where can we find you? Sure. Yeah. So I had the Moms Without Capes podcast where we talk all about reclaiming your identity beyond motherhood. And then also, if you're on Facebook, come join my Facebook group. We do challenges and events and monthly conversations and, and all kinds of fun going on in there. Oh, that sounds fun. We'll have to check it out. And we, of course, we'll have links in the show notes for everybody to grab that and just click on through. So come on over and join Ani. But before we go, I'm going to try my best to keep my mouth shut on this part. I like to end every episode with three rapid fire questions. So the first one is, what does clutter free mean to you? So before we hit play, I told you about my word of the year being simplify. And I've been binging on Minimal, minimizing or minimization. No, that doesn't sound right. Minimalism videos. Minimalism. Yep. Yep. And so clutter-free to me means no piles, <laughs> stuff which I am so guilty of, but like of just being like no piles of just like random stuff laying around. And so that to me is clutter-free. Mm, love it. Okay. I'm not adding to it. Number two, what is making you happy right now or in this season of life? So I would say my businesses, it's always on my mind. It's something that like, I'm just loving, especially the moms without capes piece of it. It does make me happy. And it's something that I feel like it's challenging. It's that new thing. Like it's something completely new. I've been at it for a while, but it definitely is making me happy because I continue to persevere and I continue to be challenged at it. And I just really enjoy doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Love that. And number three, what is a goal you have for yourself this year? So because my word of the year is simplify, I have been working on different ways. Like I've been budgeting, working on my finances. I have lots of my hangers backwards in my closet, which is so disturbing when I look at it. Cause I'm like, I just want to put them right. But I'm trying this thing of like the 80-20, right? Like you know, we only wear 20% of our clothes 80% of the time. So I'm determined to clear out my closet. And I'm finding that I really only wear 10%. <laughs> so, but like really just embodying the word simplify has been my goal for the year. And I'm doing the 12-week year, and which has really been helping me simplify like not having 20 things on a bucket list, like 20 goals. Cause last year I did have like, I think 25 and I ended up only accomplishing six of them. And the two of them were the very finally, the, the between Christmas and New Year's. <laughs> I was like, I can't just go out of the year without, with only four reached. So the 12 week year has helped me embody the word simplify by simplifying what it is that I'm actually doing to meet my goals. Very cool. How are you doing on that? Because we're recording this in March. So the first 12 weeks is almost done. 
Yeah. So I, my three goals were to meal plan each week and I have done that. And then to exercise, to move my body at least 20 minutes each day. And I have done that. There was maybe three out of the past 12 weeks. One of the things that I started doing was the two day rule which is you don't go more than two days without doing your thing. So that helps me with the moving the body thing. Because even when the day's like, I'm like, oh, I just didn't do it today. Like I know the next day I have to do it. And then the third thing was to go on weekly dates with my family, like whether one-on-one dates. Because we have so many kids, like I've been trying to either do a one-on-one date with my husband or with one child. It's worked for the most part. I wish I was better at it, but it's a work in progress. Yeah. With having three teenagers here, it's a little bit hard to keep up with them. And then I have two that live out of the house. They're they're 20 and 24. So meshing with their schedules and stuff. So I have had dates when I can. (laughs) Nice. Nice. That's awesome. I like that goal. Those goals are fun. Those are really, it's interesting. I love hearing other people's goals because I generally tend to make really large goals. (laughs) Shocker. I'm sure that really surprised everybody listening to this episode. Yeah, I've had to definitely keep it small and trying to. And when the first my goal was like, it it was a health goal. And I was okay, I included like, I'm going to eat a salad a day, I'm going to move my body and I'm going to get to bed by nine o'clock. And the first week I did. Are you my person? Are you me? (laughs) The first week I was like, I didn't do like I did the, any one of these three times this week. That's it. And I'm like, I have to bring it down. So that's why I was like the movement goal. I'm like, next quarter, maybe I'll work on the sleep one. But I'm like, I just, and overall, my health goal will be just to improve my health and just work on those little actions of things that I can control and maintain. Because I'd rather feel I've accomplished it or that I've reached it rather than continually feeling I don't, I can't. You want to be a success instead of a failure. So how do we keep it? Yeah. Yeah. And so I have to create that opportunity to be that. I can't do these huge goals and then feel a bit. And there's nothing stopping you from eating a salad every day. (laughs) You could do that, but that's just not the goal, which makes sense. Right. That's not the goal. And there are days that I do that. And hey, that's an overachieving. (laughs) Right. Look, I'm a little bonus. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. Oh my gosh, you are just like speaking. It's like you're here, like you're out of, like getting out of my body. It's weird. Anyway, I love it. Ani, this has been such a fun conversation. I really hope everyone else enjoyed it. So if you did enjoy this, please let us know in the comments or wherever we are. DM us, hit us up. We can find us everywhere. So let us know and I'll have more conversations like this and we'll have Ani back on the show. So (laughs) thanks, Beata. This was fun. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, you have a great rest of your day. You too. Oh my goodness. That episode, I think, was just what I needed today. I know that I am not alone when it comes to filling up my to-do list with all the different things because there's so much I want to do in this life. But Ani is right. It is better when we can simplify and make sure that we are getting the things that we really value done before we continue to move on. Because if we have too much on our li- on our plate, right, we're never going to be able to master any of them. And I know that I talk about that a lot. And there's a lot of areas where I do that in my life. So it's always so interesting to know that there are still areas where I'm not excelling at that. And I need to dive down dive in, get kind of granular, maybe get a little more simple and clear off my plate, nail something, right? Get something down before I add something back in. So always a good reminder, please know as you're listening to the show, I learn as much from my speakers often as you do. And it is so refreshing to know that we are in this kind of collective human experiment where we're all better at some things and worse at some things than everybody. And that's not meant as a comparison. I do believe comparison is the thief of joy, but it's just a reminder that there are areas where all of us, no matter how far ahead or down the path or where you see someone or how successful you think someone is, they still want to work on things and are still struggling with things that maybe you take for granted sometimes. So just please know that um, we all need to have grace and compassion, work on ourselves and make sure we are a priority in our own lives so that we can be uh, the examples we want to be for our families. 
So thank you so much, Ani, for joining us. I mean, it was a wonderful talk today. And I would love to know what your favorite part from the talk was, where we, we went on a lot of different topics and tangents. And I would love to know if there's any aha moment that stuck out for you please let me know or let me know if there's other questions. If you want me to have Ani back on the show, what other questions you would want me to ask her. So go ahead and comment on this post on Instagram or send me a DM. I'm wanna be clutter free on the social channels or you can come over to the wanna be minimalist family group on Facebook and share in that private community there. We would love to, you know, talk with you about the things that stood out for you the most, cheer you on, see kind of where we can all help each other as we're all rising up to the top. You can also leave a review on Apple Podcasts, comment on Spotify, or comment on YouTube. And remember, if you haven't shared this show lately with somebody, go ahead and do that today. It might be what they need to hear. And it's also one of the best ways that you can show support for what I do every week in help growing this show. So thank you so much. And then remember, you can get detailed show notes with the links for Ani's website, podcast, and everything else she's got going on at wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash the number 204. Again, that's wannabeclutterfree.com forward slash 204 to find out more about Ani. And with that, I hope you have an amazing day and I will see you back here next week. Until next time, take care, keep things simple, put yourself on the priority list, and remember, I believe in you. I'm Deanna Yates, and you've been listening to Wanna Be Clutter Free. I'll see you next week. Cheers.